Cutting thin strips on a table saw can be nerve-wracking and downright dangerous if you're not careful. It becomes difficult to effectively push the stock past the blade, and kickback can easily occur. There are a few ways to make this type of cut safer, one being to use a push block like this one. I'll use this to cut, say, half-inch strips, but when I want to cut something as thin as 1 8 I get a little nervous and I often worry I'll put the blade through the tool. The leg is replaceable, but it's enough to startle someone, which is never a good thing when using the table saw. Another option is to use a physical reference like this mag switch to the outside of the blade so you can batch out multiple strips of the exact same thickness. Once in position, just turn the knob to activate the magnet, and it's locked in place. I like the safety of this method, but the drawback is that you constantly have to adjust your fence on every single cut, which can be a bit finicky to get just right. A third option is to build a simple jig. All you need is a strip of plywood, a block for the handle, and a thin strip for the heel. I'm keeping this jig super basic, nothing fancy. I'll simply screw the wooden block that will act as a handle to the strip of plywood. I'll first create a temporary bond to hold it in place using some CA glue and activator. I can then flip it over and screw it down, after first drilling some pilot holes using a countersink bit. For the heel, I have a random thin strip of wood that I picked out of my scrap pile, but you can use a thin piece of plywood instead. I'll secure it to the back end, making sure to offset it just a bit so it won't interfere with the fence. Again, countersink hole first so I can then easily screw it in, flush with the bottom side of the jig. Notice that the heel extends past the jig to the left, which is exactly what you want. Okay, so let's try it out. I know that my plywood is exactly three and a half inches wide, so I'll set my fence to three and a half plus one eighth because I want to cut one eighth strips of wood. So now you can see I've got a narrow gap between the jig and the blade. Note that I'm cutting fairly long strips, so there's no chance that they'll fall into the opening around the blade, but if you're cutting shorter strips, you want to make sure you seal that up with some painter's tape. After a few passes, I could clearly see that it works. I'm getting thin, even strips. But I'm still feeling a little bit nervous that I'll experience some unexpected kickback, so I think I can make this jig a little safer. I've got another strip of plywood here, the same length, but ripped to exactly two inches wide. And I'm going to add it underneath the jig. The key to point out here is that the piece I'm adding has to be the same thickness as the stock you want to cut. Now I want this to be flush up against the fence, so I'll flip it on its side and clamp it, then simply secure it with a few screws. I'll also replace the heel with a slightly bigger piece. Again, I just want it to cover the entire backside and extend past a few inches to the left. Okay, let's test it out. I'm making sure my blade isn't too high, just the tips poking up above my workpiece. I'll set the fence to two and one eighths. Two inches is the width of the jig and one eighth for the width of the strips I want to cut. Wow, this feels so much better. I feel safe and in control with the jig essentially covering the blade and the workpiece. Plus, I barely have to push through the workpiece with my other hand, just letting the heel and the jig do most of the work. I love it. Definitely a safe and easy way to batch out thin, even strips. I'll be honest, I don't care much for circular saws and I rarely use them. I find it challenging to line up the cut and get a straight clean cut. Not to mention actually cut on the line. Instead, you'll see me using a track saw which is amazing for getting precise clean cuts and sheet goods. But a track saw can also be expensive and not in everyone's budget, especially if you only use it on occasion. But the good news is that you can pretty much turn any circular saw into a track saw by making a super simple guide rail. You can make it any length that you want according to your needs, but I find the 3 to 4 foot length to be ideal. You'll want one strip roughly 10 inches wide, and the other about 2 to 3 inches wide. Next, grab your saw and flip it over to get a rough measurement of the distance between the edge of the base plate and the blade. It doesn't have to be exact, but just a rough idea. 
Then add a half inch or so to that measurement and mark that onto the bigger board. You want to make sure that the reference edge here is the side that the saw blade will be on, depending if your saw is blade right or blade left. Add a little glue and clamp the other piece down right up against the line. Then grab some flathead screws and screw it down after first making some countersink pilot holes. All that's left now is to cut the edge to make the zero clearance edge which will really help you get clean and precise cuts. As you can see the jig is pretty simple. The key is to leave enough room on the opposite side of the base so you can clamp down the track without getting in the way of the motor. As you can see I have a little excess material on the blade side that I'll trim away for a perfect zero clearance base. To avoid tear out, set the jig on some scrap wood for this. Then set the height of the blade so the tip of the teeth are just poking down underneath. Then make the cut, making sure the base plate is pressed up against the fence throughout the entire cut. And with that, the jig is ready to use, so let's try it out. Remember to always support your cuts to prevent pinching of the blade. I'll trace where I want to make the cut, then line up the edge of the track on the line and clamp it down. Then just let the saw glide along the track, keeping it snug against the fence. And voila! A perfect, clean, precise, and perfectly square cut. You're welcome. Dados can be super practical in so many applications. Typically, if I wanted to make a dado, say for a bookcase, I'd draw a reference line, then grab a 3 quarter inch straight bit and set it in my router. Then do my best to set the tip of the bit right on the edge of my reference line. And yes, there are better ways of doing this, but you get the idea. Then I would butt up some sort of guide up against the edge of the router and make sure it's perpendicular to the edge and clamp it down. Now I can fire up the router and run it against the guide. And voila, we have a dado. The problem you'll often run into doing it this way is that the dado is the wrong size. The joint isn't tight and there's actually a noticeable gap you can see right here. The problem is that most 3 quarter inch plywood isn't actually 3 quarters of an inch. It's close, but as you can see here, this one is actually pretty close. This one is actually bigger than 3 quarters. And these last two are way under. I have a lot of wiggle room here. These ones are actually closer to about 23-30 seconds. And that's probably why they actually sell undersized plywood bits like this one that are 23 30 seconds. So this bit works great when your plywood is actually that dimension, but that clearly isn't always the case. So today I'm going to build a pretty simple adjustable dado jig. I've seen all sorts of dado jigs, but I'm going to try something a little different and I hope it works out. I'll cut two strips about five inches wide. And by the way, I'll have all the dimensions available on my website and I'll leave a link to that down below. All right, so I've got my four pieces and now I'm going to connect them using T-bolts and star knobs. But the first thing I want to do is create a track for the T-bolts so they don't spin endlessly as I tighten the knobs. Here I'm measuring the width of the T-bolt, but it really doesn't have to be exact or a tight fit. It can have a little wiggle room, so I'll go with about half an inch wide. I'll lower my blade to about a quarter inch and set a stop so I can make consistent grooves at each end of both of my pieces. I can then just nudge the board over to widen the groove progressively. I'll stop about midway and then adjust the stop to mark the opposite side of the groove for all of my cuts.
then remove the stop and nudge over the board until the groove is complete. Okay, so my four grooves are cut and I can do a quick test and see that my T-bolts fit nicely. Like I said, just a hair wider than T-bolts so it fits effortlessly. Next, I'm going to drill some holes right in the center of the grooves to fit the T-bolt through. I'm using a 516 bit to match the size of the T-bolts. And I'll drill holes in the smaller pieces using the same bit. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Now I can assemble it and it's ready to use. Just slip the T-bolt into the tracks from underneath. Then add the shorter piece of wood on top to connect both sides and add a washer and a star knob to each bolt. As you can see here, by moving the pieces, you can adjust the size of the slot in the middle, depending on the size of the dado you need. The easiest way to set it up is to grab the piece that you want to make a dado for and drop it in. Then adjust the jig so it's snug, but not too tight, then tighten the star knobs. Now I can just carry the jig over to my workpiece, line it up with the reference line, and clamp it down. then drop in the router. You'll need a half inch pattern bit with a top bearing like this one so the bearing can ride along the jig. Lower the bit so it pokes out by about an eighth of an inch and lock it down. You'll wanna go around in a clockwise direction starting on one side, then over to the next. I'll then lower the bit and go around again. Okay, let's test it out. I mean, yep, perfectly snug without being too tight. So with the jig, there's no more guesswork. You get the perfect dado every time. This next jig is super easy to make and oh so versatile. Some people call it a tenoning jig, but it can do way more than that. You'll only need three pieces of plywood for this. The idea is to assemble a frame sort of like this that'll ride along the table saw's fence. It needs to be snug around the fence, but not too tight. So I'll measure the width of the fence, mine being about four inches, and rip this piece to size. This outside piece doesn't need to be this tall either, so I'll trim that down a bit. There, that's good. Next, I'll clamp it together so I can assemble it with some screws. Okay, the last step is to add a vertical piece that'll act as a backstop and support your workpiece as you push it through the blade. You want this piece to be perfectly square, so I'll use a speed square to position it and clamp it down. I also recommend adding a handle of some sort. I just screwed on a block of wood. All right, slide smoothly, but you can also add a coat of paste wax on the inside if you need it to help slide along the fence a little better. So like I said, this vertical cutting jig can be used for cutting tenons, but if I'm honest, I've never built anything using mortars and tenon. Still, there comes a time when you might need to make a notch in the end of a board, like when I made my flip top planar sander cart. This is the perfect way to make that cut. It's also great for cutting bridle joints, if you're into that sort of thing. Or say you wanna cut an aggressive edge on a board. Like if you're making a pizza peel. Just tilt your blade, then clamp the board vertically to the jig and run it through. I also built a similar jig for making castle joints for a coffee table. 
but I made it a lot taller and a lot more robust to support the beefy 4x4 posts I was cutting. By adding a second horizontal support, it's much more stable. You could also make a hole through the vertical face or cut away a portion like I did here to make it easier to clamp your piece in place. The beauty of these jigs is how easy they are to make so you can easily throw one together for whatever your needs may be. I'm always looking for ways to improve my shop, even the little things. Last time I was at Princess Auto, I saw this magnetic paper towel holder and thought, why not give it a shot? I mean, instead of having my paper towel roll way up here, why not give it a home? Yeah, that's better. This is a keyhole router bit. It's a super easy way to hang things flat up against the wall. I used it for this wine rack that I made and several picture frames too. But without some sort of jig, it can be tricky to use. Actually, I'm not even really sure how you would use it without a jig. Anyhow, I'll show you how to make a super simple jig in no time. First, you'll want to measure your router's base plate. If it's round, just measure the maximum width. The idea is to then build a box around the base with a little wiggle room on one side. I'll grab a strip of 1x2 pine from my lumber cart and cut five pieces from it. Two at three and a half inches, which is the width of my router plate, and three at seven and a quarter inches, which is the width of my router plate, plus twice the width of my wood, plus three quarter inches of wiggle room. Next, I simply need to assemble the parts like so. You can use whatever method you want, I'm just going to screw it together, but I'll first drill some countersink pilot holes to prevent splitting. Then I'll line up the edges and clamp it together so nothing will move while I drive in the screws. And voila! A quick check to make sure that the router actually fits. Okay, all good. The last step is to attach this piece that'll act as a reference against the top edge of whatever you're trying to make a keyhole slot into. Just make sure it's flush and secure it. I'm using nails for now so I can show you an alternative later, but you can screw it down too. I also like to trace a center line at the top, which will make the jig easier to use. So let's say I want to hang this plaque on the wall. I'll measure and mark equally from both sides and draw a reference line, then line it up with the jig and clamp it down. Here's a look at that bit again. I like to set the height to about half the thickness of the workpiece. That way it won't blow through the bottom, but I'll still have enough material left above the collar too. Using the jig is simple. First, fire up the router, Place the router against the edge of the jig and slowly plunge the bit until the router bottoms out. Then push it all the way up and back down again. Then turn it off and wait until the router comes to a full stop before pulling it out so you don't cause any blowout. And voila, a perfect keyhole slot. The idea is to screw two round head screws into the wall, push the holes over the screws, then press the plaque down to lock it into place. It works really well. Now you may feel like the keyholes are too far from the top edge in certain situations and there's a simple way to make them closer to the top. Just move the reference stop down a bit. Say, let's try 3 quarters of an inch. There you go, now the slot will be higher up. So have fun with it, experiment, and if you're interested in this router bit, I'll leave a link down below. Hey, I hope you learned something new and discovered a jig that could be useful in your shop. Let me know which one's your favorite in the comments down below. And here are some other jig videos that you may also find useful. Until next time, thanks for watching, see you soon.